I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is my podcast. I can do the job, but running the business is quite difficult. But a lot of tradesmen lack, and I was probably one of them, is business skills. I don't mind making mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Information is all around you in the minds of people that work beside you. Welcome back to the Trench Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Reynolds, and my guest for this episode is Mark Pesci. Mark is a futurist, speaker, inventor, multiple award-winning author and podcaster, educator, and entrepreneur. He is also a keynote speaker for the 2019 World Plumbing Conference. The idea of these discussions, for those of you joining us for the first time, is to go into the trenches of achievement and talk not with people who are orchestrating from some lofty perspective, but to those high performers who are actually in the trenches honing their craft. That is including guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment. All of them are on the front lines doing amazing things. Mark has been at the forefront of the digital revolution for 35 years and is a sought-after keynote speaker for major conferences and leadership gatherings, bringing clarity, understanding, and insight. From virtual reality to education, finance, manufacturing, transportation, and communication, Mark gives individuals and organizations the tools they need to think effectively about the future, its opportunities, and its disruptions. During our chat, we covered a lot, including what a future Futurist actually does, robots and why they aren't coming for our jobs just yet, understanding the qualities and differences between computers and humans and how they can best work together, automation and where both the trade industry and most professions are headed next, augmented reality and mapping out our workspaces using wearable glasses, cryptocurrencies, driverless cars, the future of voice technology, a little on energy, and as always, much, much more. To learn more about Mark, visit his website, markpesci.com. His Twitter handle is at mpesci, or you can track him down on LinkedIn. Mark's own podcast, which we mentioned during this episode, is called The Next Billion Seconds. If you enjoy Trench Talk, head to xrn.com.au forward slash podcast and opt in for the newsletter. We'll make sure you're notified when every new episode of the show is released. Trench Talk is available everywhere. Good podcasts are served. So if you're feeling super nice and want to support the show, please leave a review, comment, rating, or whatever your chosen podcast platform allows. Enjoy my chat with Mark Pesci. Mark, thanks for doing this. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm in my home office in Melbourne this morning. Just for listener context, where are you situated? Because we are recording this while we're doing a Zoom recording today. Yes, and I'm in my home office in Chippendale in Sydney today. Oh, very nice. Now, I thought we would start with exactly what a futurist actually does day to day. It's a good question. What a futurist does is a really good question. It's a term that wasn't really used very often until a few years ago. And I have to say that it's not really a term I picked for myself. But when I was on The New Inventors on the ABC, which I did for seven years, the ABC needed something to title me as so that when they put your name up and they have a title for you, it's all very clear. And they called me a futurist. And it turns out that when the national broadcaster calls you something, it sticks. Now, I guess the best way to talk about what a futurist is, is to maybe to think of it in terms of what a climate scientist does. Now, a lot of people hear futurist and they kind of think you're a psychic and you're going to know the lottery numbers or who's going to win the Melbourne Cup, but it doesn't work like that. I'm much more like a climate scientist in that I can tell you five to 10 years out whether what you're doing will be growing well in the soils that you've planted it in, whether that's economically or culturally, business-wise, or whether they're going to be starved for resources, or perhaps the area is going to be flooded because the oceans will be rising, or whatever that might be. And so a futurist really helps organizations and individuals get ahead of the curve so that they can make the best possible decisions to position themselves well when the future arrives. Now, because you're privy to a lot of things that people with more regular type jobs don't come across, how do you think about the future? Is it an optimistic view? Is it a pessimistic view? And then, and then how do you balance the two to ensure that you don't, I suppose, become threatened or intimidated by it? Because, well, some of these technologies can be a little daunting, right? I, I think it is absolutely fair 
to be equal parts excited and terrified by the future. I think that that on balance is not a bad strategy. But I think at the same time, you can't let the terror paralyze you and you can't let the optimism blind you. And so you really do need to find a balance. And it's very hard because particularly the news media want to tell stories about how automation is going to drive all the jobs away, which is not true, or that the computers are going to rise up and kill us all, which is probably not true. (laughs) Or, you know, you can just go down the list of disasters. And of course, disasters play very well in the media. We will all click on the links. You know, we're all party to that. You can't blame anyone. Part of that's because we are all futurists ourselves. We actually do want to have some insight into what's going to happen. And when someone comes along and says, here's a prediction, we're all going to look at it. But in fact, the future is negotiated. It's based out of the decisions that we're making right now. And part of my job as a futurist is to help bring that focus into an individual's view of the world or an organization's view of the world so that they can make decisions that put them on that right path. Doesn't mean that you're always going to get exactly where you think you're going because there's a whole world out there and the world has directions and motivations and accidents and unexpected things of its own. But you can establish a direction. You can establish a star to steer your course by. And so you can do that. And if you can do that, you have every reason to be optimistic because at least you're moving toward a goal that you have set and that you understand. Now, the world itself is getting smarter. It's getting more sophisticated. It's getting richer. It's getting more complicated. And all of that makes all of the stories that we're telling about the future a lot more interesting than just good or bad. So what do you find yourself having to bring the majority of people into focus with? Is there one overriding area of technology of transformation that we continually get wrong? Well, get, get wrong is, is, I think it's probably really, uh, I, I think that's probably over, overstating it. There's this wonderful quote, it's attributed to Bill Gates, although I think like many things in the world, it didn't actually originate with Bill Gates. But one of the things that he's attributed to have said was that we always overestimate the value of a technology in the short term and underestimate its impact in the long term. So things actually take longer than we might expect. And I'll talk about this in context to driverless cars in a minute. But in fact, when they arrive, they're far more transformative than we ever reckoned. And again, so autonomous vehicles, cars that can drive themselves. Everyone really thought that these would be landing, say, sort of within about the next model year, maybe the next two model years. You had the CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, saying this. You had the CEO of Daimler saying this. You had the CEO of Ford saying this. And all of them have walked all of these predictions back over the last couple of weeks to months because it turns out actually getting a car to drive itself is fantastically hard, not because operating a vehicle is hard, but because operating a vehicle full of lots of unpredictable people and pets and weather and everything else, that's really hard. And so the further they got into the problem, the more they realized this is not just a hard problem. This is a hard problem that requires a human being to be fully involved. And if there's a human being fully involved, there's no automatic driving going on. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't solve this problem. It means that the problem is a great big problem. You can think of it in terms of technical complexity. It's kind of like the Apollo moonshot. We have to work so many different disciplines. They have to come together in just the right way. Some of its sensors, some of its computing, some of its new road systems, all of these things have to come together. And then they have to work more or less flawlessly because people will be trusting their lives to these things. And that's not something that happens in a year or two. It happens in a decade or two. But when it happens in a decade or two, it completely transforms everything we think about our road system, about mobility, about how we order our lives, about where we need to be. And so this is exactly what we're talking about. So we consistently overestimate the effects in the short term, but underestimate them in the long term. A lot of these technologies seem to race to sort of like your 80 to 85% there, which is exactly what you just said with the cars, right? And then that last little bit that we think will automatically happen just takes so long. Do you see that as a bit of a theme that runs through a number of these ideas? Yeah, and it's funny because you say 80, 80 to 5%. It looked like the 80 to 85%. In fact, that was 10 to 15%. And it's 80 to 85% that's undone. 
But we didn't know that until we started working on the problem. Oh, yes. I've classically got it around the wrong way. Yeah. It looks simpler when you're just thinking about it. It looks much simpler than it is. Yeah. Thinking computers, what we would call artificial intelligence today, pretty much everyone in the field in the 1950s and the 1960s would have told you that they were right around the corner. And I can tell you, in 2019, computers are not smarter. Even though we use artificial intelligence in a lot more interesting ways these days, the techniques themselves are not dramatically more sophisticated. They aren't 50 years more sophisticated. Computers aren't 50 years more artificially intelligent because it turned out that the first thing that we learned when we started understanding artificial intelligence was how little we knew about human intelligence. And so What's happened is the more that we get into understanding AI, the better understanding we're bringing to ourselves. That's now happening to improve AI, but we still have a lot of undiscovered territory in ourselves that we need to explore before we can attempt to program it into a computer. Kind of like learning a little bit, right? The more you learn, the more you realize that uh, you actually don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that the true experts are the ones who go, oh my God, this field is too big, I'll never master it. Yeah. <laughs> so I know, I, I know that you've got a number of thoughts in regards to digital transformation, particularly in the trade space, mm. I think around automation. Can we talk a little bit about how you think some of these primarily manual jobs will change, unfold, adjust over the next, I'm just picking a number out of the air, but over the next, say, 10 years? Sure. So let me do this by telling a little story. And this story is about Tesla Motors. So everyone's familiar with Tesla, Elon Musk's company that makes electric cars. And he announced his great big consumer car, which is the Model 3, which costs around 50,000 Australian dollars. And, you know, he opened the orders books and immediately got 18 months worth of orders. And he had to then build this enormous robotic assembly line to assemble these cars. And he said, look at folks, this entire assembly line from beginning to end, it's just going to be all robots. There really won't be many people involved. It's all going to be amazing. It'll make the cars really cheaply. He said this, and the engineers and automakers in Germany and Japan, when they heard this, they smiled. They smiled and they nodded because they tried this in the 1980s and 1990s. And Tesla builds out this enormous production line and the cars start rolling off of it, and the cars almost all have assembly errors in them. Even though there are all the robots, and the robots have been programmed with all the tasks, well, it turns out that robots really aren't good at fiddly little mechanical tasks. Robots aren't as good at sensing things, at touching things, and feeling things, and understanding the contours of things as people are. You know, there's four billion years of evolution in a person that makes that really work well, less so in a robot. And so Tesla had to go back and completely rethink their assembly line, figure out where it was a good place to be using robots and automation, figure out where it was a good place to be using humans and human skills, and then put that assembly line back together in a way that brought the best attributes of every participant into the assembly line. And that's when they finally started getting Model 3s out the door. And what we learned from this is that there isn't a binary switch. It isn't like we're all going to be automated away. We're not going to be all automated out of work. There are things that computers are really good at, that automation is really good at, that artificial intelligence is really good at, and there are things that humans are really good at. And the more that we start to use automation, the more clearly we understand the qualities, the skills, the techniques, the learning that human beings bring, and we learn how to focus them on that. And this is, I think, the future for all of the trades, that there are certain tasks that are out that are going to be easy to give to a machine because the machine doesn't need to think much about it. It's just going to go off and do it. And then there are tasks that are complex or subtle or sophisticated or rich because they have to to integrate a lot of information and data and people doing a bunch of different things. And those are going to be very human tasks because we're already very good at them. And the thing is understanding the qualities and the differences between computers and humans and then working them together into new systems that are more productive, that are more effective, that make everyone in them smarter and better at what they're doing. That's the next place that the trades are going. And in fact, it's the next place that all of the professions are going. 
So we're notoriously bad in the trade sector, to my knowledge, at collecting data. And I've sort of had a few conversations about this lately. I'm talking about the data of actually how we go about our job and what we do in the field, because there is that thought that robots are coming to take our jobs. But I think in the evolution of trades becoming digital, where maybe where GPS is in relation to driverless cars, the driverless cars need a system which they can work off the back of. Without that mapping system, they can't do anything, right? So you first of all got to map that out to then work out the best way of navigating that map and then automate the manual tasks on top of that. And for me, when I think about it that way, you realise that a lot of the machines that can come into our trade are going to be a long way in the future. Like Some of this stuff is what we're going to do with our hands for a long time, right? I really do think so. I mean, when you talk about mapping, we're going to have a lot of systems that are really good at mapping because we're going to be using augmented reality. Augmented reality is going to look like a very fancy pair of spectacles that you'll wear. And in fact, they may provide eye protection so that if you're welding or doing something where you need eye protection, they'll do that. But they'll also have fully integrated information about the world around you. And it won't just be sort of shown on a flat display. It'll be placed in space around you. So as you turn your head around, you'll see annotations around a pipe or around a pile of equipment or around a vehicle or whatever it might be. And so you have this idea that the information that we need is available, but those augmented reality glasses are also simultaneously mapping the space. So part of what everyone's going to be doing is we're actually going to be mapping our spaces much more comprehensively intensively than we have already. But then there's going to have to be a whole bunch of tools and technique. And so the computers can do the tool, but it's the humans who create the technique here that bring all of this together in a meaningful way, that don't overwhelm people with information, that don't overwhelm the computers with trivia, that allow us to use these tools, collect the information, collect the data, and then put it to work. And it's interesting that you say we're not good at collecting data about our professions, and yet plumbing and almost all of the other trades are mentoring, apprentice-based professions. And apprenticeship and mentoring is exactly how we collect and pass that data along from generation to generation. It's in practice that we do it. There may not be too much about a particular site, unless that site's quite interesting. But there's an enormous amount of data collection which represents the body of the trade. Yeah, I was talking in relation to actually making that digital, like that's got to become digital before a machine can then use it or a computer can then understand it. Am I on the right track with that thought? Yeah, you are. And again, computers are getting better and better at watching us. The question is when they watch us, how much knowledge are they getting from us? They'll copy behaviors, but will they copy the understanding that informs a particular behavior? You know, They'll see us making a decision, but will they understand why we're making that decision? Will we have to stop and explain it to them? Will we have to stop and explain it to them in every possible situation? And this is kind of the situation we're at with the self-driving cars now, where the thing that we're learning is all of these decisions that we don't think about because they're just kind of embodied when we learn to drive now have to be made quite explicit in a whole bunch of situations to these vehicles or else they're simply at a loss. So how do you, is it just a time thing for going back to the driverless cars? Does it just take time to learn all these things or, or do we have to come up with new ways of actually learning these methods as well? So, I mean, this is where we come back to your question about are we good at predicting how long things are going to take? Because I think that there's a sense that we can just teach these systems enough that they're going to be good enough in enough situations. I feel like that that is untested right now. We actually don't know if that's true. We don't know if there's more to it than that because we're engaged in an exploration. And as we digitize anything, whether it's driving or any trade, we're going to be in a really interesting process of exploration. And that exploration is going to be teaching us more about our trade as we're practicing it. And it's also going to be helping us create a new generation of tools with which we will practice the trade. These go hand in hand. And this is what the next 10, 20, 30 years look like, is actually developing these new tools. The people who are in the trade will have a hand in developing these tools and the tools themselves will shape the way the people in the trade will work. Interesting thought, isn't it, about the way that this will actually play out. If we move away from the tools and the actual physically doing the work, 
in terms of business, we're going to be affected, I would assume, by a number of the broader technology changes, I guess, that are, that are coming into effect. I know an area that you know a lot about is the crypto space. Mm. Is that going to be in everyday life? Is it going? Are we going to work with digital currencies regularly or is that going to be a bit of a subculture that is into trading digital currencies? And the, the reason that I ask this is for if you're a business owner, do you have to be thinking about these things and maybe planning for them? So the answer is yes, we'll all be trading digital currencies, but to us, they will probably look like dollars and they may very well be issued by the Reserve Bank rather than something that's like Bitcoin, which is sort of generated by itself and managed autonomously to everything and, and can be exchanged for dollars at an exchange. I think that that will continue. Whether that becomes the main thing, I think is less likely. But what we will see is digital dollars because there's a disconnect between the way money works and the way smartphones work. You can't really keep money on your smartphone. You and keep your credit cards on your smartphone. And when you go into a tap and pay, say with Apple Pay or Google Pay, it's effectively just tapping your credit card. It's the same thing. There's no money actually being stored on your phone. And it's fine in Australia. It's not so fine in India or in Africa and China where people don't have credit cards. And so there's really got to be a better way for them to be able to to trade just with their smartphones because they all have smartphones, but they don't all have bank accounts. And so we can see digital money as a way to close that gap. But again, once that problem gets solved in the developing world, that actually comes back and speeds up payments here in, in the developed world. And so we start to see a world where banking becomes something that's a lot more fluid, where it looks less like an institution and looks more like an app on your phone or a series of apps. And they're all moving the money on your phone between them behind the scenes. And you're only vaguely aware of it when you go to pay for something or you go to check your bank balances. This is going to be particularly important for businesses, particularly if they're ordering things that are coming in from overseas, because a lot of trade finance, particularly for larger businesses, will be done through these channels because it makes trade finance a lot easier to manage. We'll have things called smart contracts, which is code that's literally written into this digital money so that if you order something from a supplier in China that you've never done business with before, you can escrow the funds until the goods have been received and have been approved by you. And you won't need a lawyer and a bank for that because you'll literally write the escrow contract into the money when you make the payment. So there's a lot of ways that digital money will make some business processes a lot more sophisticated and a lot less expensive than they are today. So does that mean that we will we will go a lot wider with our purchasing behaviors, I guess you'd say, right? If buying from China becomes even, as an example, even easier than it is today? Yeah, one of the things that the cryptocurrencies and digital money enable is the creation of new value chains. And that can be people who are subcontractors working on a site. They're their own set of value chains. And that may be the way that you're keeping that value chain economically connected. It may be suppliers who are working in different parts of the country or different parts of the world who are also all funneling in to be able to deliver on time the parts that you need on site for a particular job. And all of that's kind of hard and slow and expensive right now. And over the next 20 years, Years, it's going to get much faster and much easier to manage. And again, when we think about these smart contracts with this code written into the money, it won't necessarily be you who's sitting and writing this code. That could be part of the app that you're using, or it could be part of an artificial intelligence that your bank is offering you so that it helps you handle your trade finance. Because banks aren't going to go away. What they're going to do is they're going to start to offer different levels of service because we will be more sophisticated consumers of those services. Rather than just having banking and checking in a credit card, we're going to have a sophisticated array of financial services that are available to us inexpensively because digital digital money has lowered the barrier on them. That means that the banks aren't going to be able to make money from clipping the ticket like they do today. So they're going to find new ways to make money. And don't worry about the banks. They will find new ways to make money. <laughs> do, you, do you have any thoughts on what some of those new ways may be? One of the things that businesses need to do, particularly if they're businesses at scale, is they need to manage their cash flow and they also need to manage their cash on hand, right? And, and these are tools, you generally have a CFO. If you have a big enough business, you have a CFO who's charged with doing that. And 
there's going to be some level of business that's going to be between sort of a large business and a small business. So somewhere in the SME range, those businesses haven't really had access to those kinds of services before. They can benefit from them, but they've been too expensive. And so you can see that there's a real gap there. And you can see some startup businesses that are offering what they call CFO in a box, where basically, you know, they will run that function for you. And so it's almost like outsourcing. But I think that those services will go progressively more automated. I think also certain kinds of legal services, basic contracts and things like that. And whether that's coming from your bank or from a legal firm that might be running as an app on your phone and again, paid with this digital money, all of that's going to start to get a lot more sophisticated, a lot richer in what's offering. You think about the kinds of apps that you have on your smartphone today, they're just, they kind of do one thing, right? They're a communication app or they're a billing app or they're an invoicing app. I want you to start to imagine what happens when the apps start talking to one another and you start building services and value chains out of that. And that's not something you're going to have to worry about or think much about. You're just going to think about the things you need to do to run your business and then you'll have the right apps installed that will help that happen. Can you just explain what a, what a service or value chain is and an example of maybe a couple of apps that may end up talking to each other, even if you just make up their names and functions? Well, we, don't, we don't even have to make up their names and functions. I'm going to give you a really sort of outstanding example. So Alibaba is the largest e-commerce company in the world. We kind of don't think about it much because it's Chinese-based, but they're actually much larger than Amazon. And Alibaba has an enormous storefront with all sorts of components. Now, I do a lot of stuff in electronics. There's a lot of electronics components up in Alibaba, and they represent pretty much everything that's on sale in Shenzhen, which is the big electronics center in China. But they can ship those anywhere you want over the world. And so you can imagine if I want to make a new widget, then I could go on Alibaba and I can find all the pieces for the widget put those together and then go to a contract manufacturer with the design and say, okay, here are all the pieces I need. Here's the design that I need to have manufactured. You need to put these together. And then here's the list of people that we need to ship these finished products to. So now I've, I've both bought all the components for the product, gotten them to the manufacturer and now gotten them shipped to the customers for that product. So I've created a value chain there. And Alibaba can probably do all of that because it's got relations to all of them. And Alibaba has a subsidiary called Ant Financial. And if you've seen Alipay at any of the places in Melbourne or Sydney where there's a lot of Chinese tourists, this is how people pay. They scan a code on their smartphone and it takes the money directly out of the bank. Alipay is now three times bigger than the Commonwealth Bank. And Commonwealth Bank is one of the biggest banks in the world because they've produced this economic system that allows all of these companies that are on Alibaba to be connected in a payments mechanism. And so they can create their own value chain. So people can be buying and selling and producing new things using it. This is very much where the future is going. And you can see eBay's trying to do this, but doesn't have all the pieces in place. Amazon kind of isn't low level enough. You can order finished products from Amazon, but it's hard to get a lot of raw materials from it. You can see Alibaba sort of taking the entire cake and saying, we have all the pieces and we have a payment system that ties them all together. When you start to add perhaps sophisticated AI to this so that I can say, I want something that works like this. And then the AI says, well, here's a design that I can propose that I found somewhere. Here's a manufacturer I've proposed that can put it together. And here's a prospective list of clients. You can actually see how these systems can become very powerful. And some of these tech companies can become very powerful in terms of how quick they can come into some of these spaces, right? Because we've just seen that Facebook has announced their own cryptocurrency just recently. So when you have access to so many people, building these value chains in becomes a lot faster, right? Because you're already connected with the client base, I guess you'd say. Yeah, I mean, you're really talking about what we're now calling platform economics. And so Facebook has, I think it's around two and a half billion people who use the platform, whether that's WhatsApp or Instagram or Facebook, pretty much every month. And every one of those people are going to have access to the new Facebook cryptocurrency called Libra. And so Facebook already has all of these people connected together and already understands a lot about their relationships. 
And now you're incentivizing those relationships potentially with commerce. And that creates something that's very, very potent. It will be more potent than probably any economic force we've seen so far in the 21st century. And it could really become a monster in that it will be so much of a marketplace. It's going to be pretty much the place people buy and sell. Now, that won't be true in China because Facebook simply doesn't have a footprint in China. Probably won't be true in India because India doesn't want people using cryptocurrencies, at least not yet. But in many parts of the world, we could see Facebook becoming the default. For example, in Indonesia, where Facebook is very much the way people access the internet. Libra and Facebook and these economic systems could become the new platform for a whole range of new businesses in Indonesia to be able to be paid and to build their own value chains. So what's the likelihood of them then building service offerings into their platforms? Well, this is always going to be an interesting question. The thing that Facebook really wants out of this is they want all of the data around who is spending money where. You know, they already know sort of where you go and where you surf. They track all of that information that all fits into your profile. Now they're going to know what you're spending your money on and where you're spending it. And that allows them to profile you even better and presumably to target goods and services to you around the things they already know that you're buying. So at some level, it's just taking Facebook up a notch. But I think in terms of the people who are using Facebook to transact, it's really important to note that there's a lot of people in the world who have a smartphone, use it for everything except for buying and selling, because that's the one thing they can't do because they don't have a form of money that fits on their smartphone. And so we're probably going to see an explosion of economic activity in the developing world when people finally have a currency that works well with the device that they already have in their hands. Remember, we have over 4 billion smartphones in the world, and there's only 7 billion people. So most of the adults on the planet are now walking around with a smartphone, and at least half of them can't do any commerce on them. Once that happens, the kinds of commerce people in the developing world will do may be very basic. They may be around sustenance, selling things and buying things that they need to live. But there's going to be so much of it happening everywhere that it's going to transform the way business works. So I'm thinking that these, well, there's really the five or six big tech giants, right? They're positioned at the moment to grow with these changes to become a lot bigger than what they are right now. Yeah, after Facebook went public in 2012, I wrote a prediction. Sometimes futurists get to do that. And I said, look, I think Facebook's going to go into banking. I was years too early, but that's the deal with the futurists too. We get to be years too early. I said, if Facebook goes into banking, they will be the first trillion dollar company. And they missed that because Apple and then Microsoft and then Amazon now trade places being the first trillion dollar company. But if Libra really takes off the way that it looks like it will, then Facebook will actually probably zoom ahead to be far larger because it will be at the hub of an entirely new galaxy of businesses and commerce, all of which will be taking place through Facebook and around Facebook. And Facebook will probably, like any bank, find plenty of ways to clip the ticket as the money is passing through. At the moment, I think Facebook is roughly just over half the size of, of Microsoft. Is that about, about right? It's about 580 billion US and Microsoft's about a trillion US. So, yeah, okay. Which is, again, in a relative sense, not far. So it's a factor of two. That's not very far at all. Just uh, $500 billion just sounds like a lot of money. <laughs> sounds like a lot <laughs> of money. <laughs> not, not when you're Facebook and not when you've just introduced Libra. Yeah, it remains to be seen because Facebook has had a checkered past of late and they've played fast and loose with privacy and with data for a long time. It remains to be seen whether Libra itself will get the kind of backing that it's going to need to become the next currency. But even if it's not, the fact that a large, large, like the fifth largest company in the world introduced a new currency was an actual wake-up moment for all of the central bankers in the world who have effectively been dragging their feet on digital money because central bankers, I know central bankers, they're lovely people, but they treasure stability, they treasure safety, they don't like doing things that are exciting because things that are exciting are generally, for a central banker, not necessarily things that are good for an economy. And so they've been very, very slow about this. Credit cards are about as exciting as they like to get. 
because the larger the transformation, the bigger chance for cratering an economy. And so they've been dragging their feet about this transition into digital currencies. They won't be able to do that anymore. And I'm pretty sure that within the next decade, you will see a digital US dollar, you'll see a digital yuan, you'll probably see a digital Swiss franc, you'll probably see a digital euro. The Reserve Bank of Australia is very conservative, so I'm not sure you're going to see a digital Aussie dollar. But you'll see many other digital currencies and they'll be in common use. So whether or not Libra is a success, whether or not Facebook gets that, really doesn't matter because whatever digital currency comes around, Facebook will simply integrate into Messenger and into Instagram and into Facebook itself, and then people will start using it to trade. So are you in favor of getting on early with some of these changes and trying to, I guess, get ahead in this tech evolution, or do you rather sit back, let it play out, and see how it starts to mature before you then make your move, if you like. There are some points to note. One is that pioneers can be identified by the arrows in their back. <laughs> and so there's a price to be paid for, for getting there first. And there's also a lot of glory that it can accrue for getting there first. And you always have to balance that out. If you have a very successful business and it's going well, why do you change? Why would you want to change? I'm always really pleased when, as a futurist, I'm retained by a business that is going well because it means that the board has their eyes on the future. They actually want to know how they can be better placed in five years than they are today. Quite often, I get the call by a business that hasn't done that and is being disrupted because new entrants have come into the market that are doing things differently. And by the time they call me, it's almost too late to save the furniture. And so you really have to take a look at the business that you're in today and the business that you're going to be in 5, 10, 15 years from now. And do you think that you're going to be on that path. Are you on that path safely? And that then sets your degree of risk of how far out in front of the curve do you want to be? I do think that everyone in the trades should be learning about the new tools and should be participating in the design of the new tools that they will be using. Because I think this is important. There's an enormous amount of information that's embedded and embodied and implicit in trades that trades people need to make explicit so that it can end up in the tools that they can be using. You don't want these tools designed by engineers who don't understand the trade. And that happens so much. And it's a beautiful example. We've had amazing medical computing systems for 30 years now, and doctors never use them because they've never been adapted to a doctor's or a nurse's workflow. You go into a lot of hospitals, everything is still on paper. And that's not because doctors and nurses are stupid. It's because every system they've ever been sold has been designed from an engineer's point of view rather than from a doctor's or nurse's or God forbid, a patient's point of view. And so it's always about thinking about the design of these tools. And this is where people working in trades can take an active role. Remember, we started this conversation talking about actually walking into the future knowing what you're doing. Well, this is one of the decisions that can be made now. And that's not so much about an investment in a particular technology as it is about helping them guide the decisions around where that technology is going. And that's true of both the software space and the hardware space, I would have thought, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What kinds of tools do you need is a question for both software and hardware. Your own career, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes on that, if that's all right, yep. because you were very early into this tech space. Yep. What was it that first grabbed you about this way of doing things? Because it was the late 70s, early 80s, I think that you first became involved, which was a very different world, I'm imagining, back then than it, than it is today. It certainly was. I mean, personal computing was called microcomputing. There were a few very basic systems. I, but I, I think from the first time I touched one of these systems, I knew that I wanted to be working with these systems. And then as I learned more about the field that I was working in, learned more of what was possible in the field, was exposed to some of the guiding ideas of the field. You know, that allowed me to sort of set my own designs. And I was working in virtual reality relatively early because I knew people who were working in virtual reality when I was in uni. 
I started working in hypertext, which is the basis for the World Wide Web very early because a hypertext conference was happening at my uni and I just happened to know people who had gone to it and they told me what they were working on and got me very excited. So some of what I have been lucky enough is that I've been exposed at particular points in my own career and in my own education to ideas that excited me and things that I wanted to work on. And I found that the longer that I did that and the more that I did that, the more fulfilling it was and the more I could see where I wanted to take my career, but also where computing was going and the world would be going as a result. And do you still work in the development space today? It's, I can't say yes or no, because I do occasionally get the idea to build something and and I can prototype things relatively quickly. It's more that the speed bump it gets higher. It's, it has to be more and more interesting. But what will happen is that someone who's younger than me, who maybe hasn't tried a problem, will come and say, how should I do this? And I'll give them the best read that I can from my own years of experience. And so it's not that I don't build things anymore. I definitely do. I have a lot of tech around. Part of what I need to do is I need to stay across tech. So I need to use tech because that's the only way I can articulate it to people who are asking me what's coming. And so there's a lot of tech here. Whether I'll be building completely new systems from scratch again in my career is an open question. I suspect I probably will, but I don't want to sort of take a gamble on that. Is your particular interest in cryptocurrencies? I know I know you've done a lot of stuff on that recently and speaking and writing and that. So is that the sector within all of this that you find your passion today? Oh, I, I think it would be fair to say that I have several passions. Certainly one of them is in cryptocurrency. One of them is in augmented reality. I, I, and, you know, that's been going on for 30, 35 years. I think another one is also thinking about sort of the culture of knowledge and the web that we've built for ourselves, that we've built this enormous knowledge machine, which it turned out was also an enormous ignorance machine. And that we're not just talking about technology, but we're talking about where technology touches us as people. And I find that really interesting as well. And so when I work as a futurist, I tend to bring as much from everything that I'm interested in into the conversation. And we'll see, you know, different clients have different places where they need to be brought into that conversation and you judge that. But I I feel as though there's not one single area that's exciting me. There's a lot that's exciting right now. And on the customer experience model, it's almost like a, because of the evolution of some technologies, are we going to see an experience as an example of booking a tradesman become better? <laughs> well, I guess what we need to ask is better from whose point of view? Is it better from the tradesperson's point of view? Is it better from the customer's point of view? Is it better from the home's point of view? And there are different answers depending on which question you ask. But The thing is, we weren't asking those questions at all five or 10 years ago, and we are actually asking those questions now because customer experience, CX, is now a design focus, and we can understand how we can make that design work. The temptation is going to be designing customer experiences that fleece the customer, that offer the customer the least value, even though the customer feels as though they're getting a very smooth experience. And I think that's always a constant temptation when you're designing these things. And I think it will take some time to find the right settings around the experience that works well for the customer, that works well for the tradesperson and works well for the home or the building or facility that's being worked on. And it's finding the sweet spot between those three, which is never going to be the same from customer to customer or tradesperson to tradesperson or building to building. But it's good that we can have that conversation now and to know that not so much that there's a right or wrong answer, but that there's an approach, a way of thinking about it. Yeah, opening that can or gate or what, however you say it is, is probably the important part, right? Because across many industries, the possibilities are now being talked about, which is exactly what you're saying. So that's kind of uh, pretty exciting for the future, I think, because tech's come so far, but to my mind, there's still a lot of things that are very clunky that seem like they should be easy problems to solve, but we haven't quite got there yet. 
And and remember that opening line that we always overestimate the impact in the short term and underestimate the impact in the long term. And customer experience is a relatively new term of art. And it was applied first in technology, but now it's getting applied to pretty much anything that involves buyers and sellers. And so in 20, 30 years, we might not even use the term anymore. It might just be an expectation for that's how things work. But we're in this middle ground now where we actually need to name it because that's how we can highlight it and focus on it. And his voice talked up more than what it's going to be, or are we going to move to a, a particularly voice-focused and voice interaction way of doing things? A voice is part of a broad mix of the ways that we will be interacting with the world. And and again, it comes back to this same problem that artificial intelligence has, that self-driving cars have, which is that it's possible to get to, uh, to a certain point with Alexa or with Siri or with Google Assistant. And then beyond that point, it's a little harder. Now, Google has shown some amazing work with Google Duplex, which basically can act almost as a receptionist. And you can call it and you could book an appointment, for instance, with a tradesperson using Google Duplex. And it's going to work as long as the conversation stays on fairly narrow rails. But if in the middle of this conversation, I perhaps break off and start to talk about how the swans are really not playing very well this season, or something that's just completely out of context to that conversation, the AI assistant's going to get lost because it's not going to be able to manage the context the same way a human being might go, well, you know, I'm a pie supporter, so I don't really care or whatever it might be. And so part of what we're going to see is that in some of these voice systems, it's not so much that the voice systems will get smarter, but we will train ourselves to get the results that we want out of these voice systems. And it's gonna be in that sense, more like driving a car or a heavy vehicle. If we have a voice system that's very powerful, but not as smart as we would want it to be to understand all of our nuance, then when we speak to them, we're going to need to be very clear and very direct and very plain so that these systems have the capacity to understand us. Now, there's another side to this. I was talking to an AI researcher and she said that she's basically taken Alexa out of her house because she saw her five-year-old shouting, Alexa, get me a pizza at it all the time. (laughs) Which sounds funny, but she's like, "I I want my child to grow up being polite and I don't want him to have that relationship where he's just commanding things and expecting them to do them. And and Alexa was permitting that because Alexa really hadn't said, sorry, what's the magic word? You know, the way any parent would. And so we have to think about these devices, not just when they're being used by adults, but when they're being used by a range of people who are encountering them in a whole bunch of different ways and are affecting them deeply, particularly children who are still learning all the nuances of social interactions. And so we have to think about that as an element of the design of voice interfaces, because voice is pretty much the oldest human technology, right? It's the way talking, language, all of that stuff that's all so basic and essential to us. It's not so much that the computers are having a hard time with it. It's that so much of that is part of the trade of being human. We haven't really managed to teach a lot of it to those machines yet. Yeah, that psychological impact, right? After we get some of these technologies like voice and then we learn how to use them, I can almost see us coming full circle in that the softer skills are going to become probably rare, more important and more desirable if we think about it as sort of like a a circle that we're going to go around. Yeah. I mean, the softer skills, I, I hope they don't become more rare. They're certainly going to become more desirable. There's no question about that. But I, I think, and when I talk to educators, and I'll be talking to educators next week, I really tend to emphasize mentoring, which is a soft skill, the ability to be mentored, which is a soft skill, and peer mentoring, which is another soft skill, as kind of being core skills for everyone in the 21st century, that if we get those right, everything else is going to kind of take care of itself because we will be able to learn from one another. There's going to be other skills about how we can master all of the amazing tools for learning that we have so that we can use the machines to help us learn. But it's always going to have a fundamentally human focus because learning and learning from one another, it's kind of the core of what makes us human. And if we fail on those soft skills, then we fail on pretty much everything else we're going to set out to do. 
And did the pizza arrive at any point? <laughs> I think so, but I think that may have been the last time the pizza arrived. That was the <laughs> problem. Was the child was being rewarded for bad behavior. And mom saw this. Mom's an AI researcher. She's like, I do not want that going on. Yeah, pizza in Alexa out. That would seem to be very aware of, right? I can, um, I've heard a couple of cases now of parents finding their, their kids yelling at the Google device and, and, and the likes of Alexa. So something to think about in the, going forward, that's for sure. A couple more questions, Mark, and I'm going to wrap up because I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you. But I've had a couple of successful tech entrepreneurs on Trench Talk mm. who have chosen to move to Australia due to its location. Mm -hmm. And I know you did an episode on your own podcast, very successful podcast too, about uh, billionaires building bunkers and no. sort of yes. getting ready for uh, some sort of world uh, catastrophic event and protecting yes. themselves. Now, I wanted to ask whether you're thinking along these lines and whether you chose to move to Australia <laughs> for those reasons and if indeed you do think that Australia is a safe place to live. So I'm not a billionaire. I think we should probably make that clear to the, to the listeners. Oh, yeah. The, the episode was on billionaires. It wasn't, uh, it, yeah, it, yeah, you yeah. weren't the focus of that episode. Oh, excuse me if I was unclear on that. No, no, no. It's quite all right. Look, I think Australia's isolation is a good thing and a bad thing, right? You know, we're slightly cut off from the flow of ideas. It takes a long time to get here. It gives us an island laboratory, which is also a continent-wide laboratory for being able to test things and people and ideas. And I think in some areas, it's made us incredibly sophisticated. Our mining and agriculture industries are probably the most sophisticated in the world because we haven't had a lot of people. And so we've had to use a lot of automation and sophisticated tools. But it can also lead to a lot of insular thinking, things that work here. We have an oligopoly of four banks protected by the Reserve Bank. It's protected the economy quite well, but it's also stifled a lot of financial innovation. And so there's a give and take around all of that. I have never regretted the decision to move to Australia. I find Australia a brilliant civilization, a brilliant culture. I'm excited to be a part of it. And one of the happiest days of my life was back in 2011 when I became an Australian citizen. So, so in that sense, I, I feel like I made the right decisions. Is this the right place to hide when the climate changes? I think we already know the answer to that is no. <laughs> but being an island goes a little against you, right? Well, it's more being a desert goes a little bit well, against you. Well, yeah, true. So we, we have literally the hottest continent in the world, and that is not changing. And so as we get that second degree of warming over the next 15, 20 years, as we get the third degree of warming over the next 40 years, as we think about what it means to preserving water, and this comes directly into what the trade of plumbing is going to be. It's going to be more and more and more around designing systems that conserve every last drop of water or recycle every last drop of water. We stand a chance of being better at that than anyone else in the world because we will have no choice. Forced to do it. That's a very good point, actually, because our potential for solar, number one, is is huge, right, due to that climate. So, yeah. And the vast amount of sun that we, that we do have. So there's so many opportunities in that space. Yeah, it's unbelievable, really. Yes. And, and, you know, the way some batteries work for storing solar power is their flow batteries. So you're actually moving liquid around. So again, plumbing is going to have this other interesting relationship with energy that it doesn't have today. And that will already be commonplace by, say, 2040 or 2050. And some of the best makers of flow batteries are here in Australia for precisely that reason. And a big issue, I had a conversation just recently about this because the problem with solar is the storing of the energy that you create during the yep. day, right? Because when the sun goes down, you don't want your lights to turn off. So yep. those technologies are getting very, very good as well. And yeah, again, exciting because we are very inefficient users of our resources and energy, aren't we? When you start to think about it. Well, we've never had to focus much on efficiency. And now that we do have to focus on efficiency, and again, miners and agriculture have had to focus on efficiency miners because they haven't had a lot of people agriculture because they haven't had a lot of water. And so once you actually focus on it, it turns out that uh, the story that Australians tell themselves about being very inventive and very innovative, this is where it comes to the fore. This is where you can see all of the interesting ways that we can save water, that we can conserve energy. 
Necessity is the mother of invention. And in some ways, Australians have a unique set of necessities that will create a unique set of inventions. So you plan on spending a few more years here? I do indeed. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Now, a couple of just last little things here. Uh, You don't own a car? No, I do not own a car. And you only own two books? (laughs) No, I have a house full of books. Oh, you have a house full of books. I have a house full of books. I read that you only own two books. No, no, no. My goodness. Someone has been spreading lies. Okay. That was going to be a good answer to that question because I normally ask for book recommendations. So, And I thought (laughs) if you only own two, this is going to be really easy. But um, do you have any book recommendations on the next, well, I'll use your term, the next billion seconds, which is the name of your podcast. I'll uh, plug that. And it sort of translates out into about the next... 30 years? Yeah, about the next generation. Absolutely. So, look, my friend Doug Rushkoff, who was on the show, was the one who was talking about the billionaires, just did a book called Team Human. And it really is about framing the relationship that we want to have with one another in a world where these very big companies producing these very big automation and artificial intelligence systems. Doug's really good at getting to understanding a problem two, five, 10 years before anyone else does. And I think he's really hit the nail on the head with Team Human. Because in a lot of ways, the choices that we're being offered about the world that we want to live in, they're from a limited menu. And what we really have to do is maybe put some write-ins on the menu. There are different ways that we can be, different ways we want the culture, the economy, our government to be. And we need to think about those. And we need to think about them not just in terms of being resentful because we don't have them. We need to think about how we can work together to make them happen. And that's very much what Team Human is about. Team Human, I'll put that on my list to work my way through. You have some fascinating guests, by the way. Um, If you want to dive a bit deeper into this space, then um, the podcast is perfect for that. What apps do you have currently sitting on your home screen, Mark? On the home screen, let me just open up the phone. Let's see. I mean, I've got all the normal ones, right? I've got Google Maps. I've got Okay, 1Password is actually an app that probably everyone listening should know because we all have all those different passwords for all the different services and we almost always use the same password because we need to remember it. And 1Password is an app that will generate a new password for you for all these different apps. And you can put that in and you don't need to remember it because you can use 1Password. It will open up the app and type the new password in for you. And so it makes it very easy to manage that so that if you get, if someone breaks into some system somewhere and gets that password, you have to change all of your passwords. It's not the way you should be doing it. And someone's always breaking into a system somewhere to do that. The other app that I use a lot is Signal, which is a chat app, but it's encrypted end to end, which means no one else gets to read your messages. Not Google, not the government, not Apple, not anyone. So if you really want to have a private conversation, Signal is probably the really good way to do it. And then my other big app on the home screen is my fitness pal. And I use my fitness pal, which is just sort of almost a calorie counting and activity app. I used that to lose 20 kilos last year and I've managed to keep it off because I've been using my fitness pal. What's your chosen form of exercise? Do you have a favorite? I swim and I run. Oh, very good. And I walk everywhere. I mean, this is the advantage of not owning a car is I'm forced to walk everywhere. Of course. And uh, cheaper, right? It's hard to drive around Sydney anyway, so... Yeah, it would just make me cranky to have to drive. (laughs) Yeah, I bet. A question that I do ask everybody, if you could have one law changed or implemented, what would that be? So look, at I came to Australia on a 457 visa, which is a great way of getting talent to the country. And the government has really shut down the 457 visa program. And it feels to me like we want to be attracting smart people from all over the world to do amazing things. And I feel as though if we could change that law and open up the 457 visa program, we would be opening ourselves up to another generation of incredibly talented, incredibly capable, incredibly inventive people who could work with us to take the country forward. That is a good answer. And I just thought of one other question in regards to that password app that you had. Using our faces, fingerprints as passwords, mm. do you, first of all, do you do that? And then how do you deal with the problem that if they're indeed hacked, you can't change those things? So how does that work? So I do use Face ID on because uh, I have an iPhone. And theoretically, the way it's implemented is that that facial data never leaves the iPhone. So it never gets transmitted on the net. So it can never be stolen. It's always secured in a special part of the processor on my iPhone. And so what happens is when it's unlocking, the computer is scanning, the phone is scanning, is comparing it to the image that's stored in that special area on the chip. 
So that means as long as it never gets sent anywhere, there's no opportunity for anyone to sniff it and steal it. And theoretically, even if my phone gets kidnapped by aliens and they take it apart, they couldn't find that information because the process of taking the phone apart would destroy the information. Now, that's the theory. The practice is never going to be that perfect. But you have to take a look at these technologies and ask these questions. It's like, why should I trust that my fingerprint or my face is going to be secure? And I did look at this process and said, okay, I can trust enough of that process that it's unlikely things will go badly. But you also have to think about the fact that we've already gone from finger, well, from voices to fingertips to faces. We're probably going to find increasingly more interesting ways of doing this. You can think about the world of the science fiction film Gattaca, where they had DNA sequences that worked instantaneously and someone could touch it, would take a drop of blood and it would immediately identify you. And we can't be that far away from something like that either. That's a deep rabbit hole to go down. Isn't it once you start talking about all of those things, it's uh, the mind boggles. Yeah, yeah. We, we left the world of biology alone, although the next series of the next billion seconds, because we haven't talked about that yet, is all going to be about the living world and we're going to dive very much into that. Oh, okay. Awesome. That will be, uh, I'll look forward to that series. There's so many possibilities and um, look, uh, right outside as this conversation is my area of uh, expertise. So um, I do enjoy listening and, and, and learning new things all the time in that space. So is there anything you wanted to add, Mark, before we wrap up? You are a keynote speaker at the World Plumbing Conference yes. coming up in just a couple of months from today. Yep. We are recording this in, what, July 2019. Can you talk about what you might talk about when we see you there? Well, I haven't been given a brief yet, so it'll be interesting to find out what they want me to talk about, although I suspect that some of their questions about automation and where the profession is going, some of the things that we talked about will probably be themes. And I think part of what I want to do is to calm people down. The robots are not coming to put us out of work. The robots are coming to help us work better. That might be a nice point to wrap up on, uh, Mark. I appreciate you carving out a little bit of your day to have a chat and for doing this. And I, I look forward to actually meeting you in person in, uh, in just a couple of months. It's been a pleasure. Hey, everybody. It's Matt again. Thanks for listening. Just a couple of things before you guys clock off. You can get all Trench Talk episodes at xrm.com.au forward slash podcast. You can also sign up for other goodies at the same site. Just plonk your email in there and you are covered. That's X for X-Ray, R for Romeo, M for Mike, dot com, dot au, forward slash podcast. If you really like what I'm bringing you, please head to iTunes, subscribe to this show and leave a review right there. And lastly, if you want to contact me directly, type the at symbol followed by Mr. Matt Reynolds into your search bar and you'll find all the social links. Goodbye.